Hey, gang, this week's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Hey, LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates that you want to talk to faster. Did you know that every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free now at linkedin.com slash good seats. That's linkedin.com slash good seats to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And now here's our show. Well, as the saying goes, Blainer, you win a few, lose a few, and a few are rained out. But ever since hitting town in 53, the Braves have furnished the fans with untold thrills and have consistently been in contention. The passing parade sees stars come and go, but new faces keep the picture bright and exciting. A popular Andy Pathko reaches the end of the line, but along comes a young Joe Torrey to replace him. Trades may see us say farewell to a Billy Bruton or Joey Jay or Johnny Logan, but in their places are stars like Frank Bowling and Roy McMillan. The turnover is terrific, but the fun and excitement go on and on, and it's always great to be at Connie Stadium to see what will happen next. Right you are, Earl, and in days and seasons to come, we'll experience new thrills, see new stars, and bask in the glory of more pennants and world championships. Earl and I will be seeing you and the Milwaukee Braves at beautiful Milwaukee County Stadium. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. All right, greetings, everybody. How are you doing? Uh, Welcome, uh, welcome, and welcome to the proceedings this week. My name is Tim Hanlon, your pal, your confidant, your doctor of defunct, your reverend of relocation, and it's Good Seats Still available, yes. The curious little podcast, not so little anymore. I, we, I'm just amazed at uh, just the uh, the breadth and the uh, depth of the uh, listenership from literally all over the world. Uh, and it's our exploration into what used to be in professional sports. Uh, our little tribe here uh, is, uh, you know, continually fascinated by uh, all kinds of stories uh, about teams and leagues and and situations in pro sports that. Uh, have come and gone for whatever various reasons. And we look for lots of different adjuncts, lots of different excuses to get into fascinating conversations. And this week is absolutely no exception. So uh, let's uh, let's set the table, shall we? Okay, so the clip there from, it's about the Milwaukee Braves. Yes, it's a, that's a topic and that's our entree. Um, the Braves, obviously a topic we've talked about with um, uh, our pals, uh, Bill uh, Pavletich uh, back in episode 32 uh, Patrick Steele back in episode number 121. Uh, you, of course, know that the uh, the Braves of Atlanta in Major League Baseball. Uh, yes, if there is Major League Baseball this year, um, uh, it, were previously domiciled in a couple of places. Uh, Boston, we've talked about that with pre- in previous episodes. But, of course, quite lovingly and quite memorably uh, for a whole generation or two of fans, Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Braves. Uh, that clip, uh, as you may remember, uh, if you're a Braves fan from that era, uh, features the voices, the dulcet tones of uh, Messrs. Earl Gillespie and Blaine Walsh, two of the uh, uh, mighty uh, broadcast voices uh, covering Milwaukee Braves broadcasts uh, during uh, arguably the height of their existence there. 53 through 61 uh, was this album. It was called Go Get Em Braves. It's an old album, an RCA Victor recording sort of uh, highlighting uh, various radio uh, memor- uh, memorable uh, moments uh, from that era. And um, you get a sense there of the Milwaukee Braves uh, and the excitement that was uh, befitting that franchise, a uh, world championship in 57 and uh, contending uh, uh, play and, and all of that. Why do I uh, give that a setup? Well, our guest this week, Pat Jordan, uh, was a draftee. Uh, I don't even we can call it a draftee. He was basically one of the uh, uh, a group of of players uh, back in 1959, 58, 59, um, who was uh, sort of labeled as a bonus baby. Now, you have to remember that there was no draft per se uh, in baseball at that time. And scouts were out there looking at players in the high school level and uh, amateur level uh, of play all around the country and would offer them significant uh, bonuses or signing uh, enticements to uh, to join uh, into their uh, into their farm systems. Um, and Pat Jordan has a an amazing story and entree into that uh, as a 
uh, a phenom, a, a pitching phenom in uh, in Connecticut uh, back in the fifties, the late, uh, the mid to late fifties. He was one of those bonus babies. Uh, received a, a hefty check, uh, helped pay off uh, his parents' mortgage and, and other things, and uh, he was sort of labeled as sort of one of the next big things uh, in uh, in local baseball lore there in 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 suburban in the Connecticut area, but also uh, as a potential. Uh, uh, a major league player over time. And the story of that experience and four plus years laboring in the then Milwaukee Braves minor league system became basically the fodder for, uh, by many accounts, one of the most um, revered sports books of all time. Sports Illustrated, back when it was relevant, you know, uh, is uh, as constantly and consistently uh, rated a false spring by Pat Jordan as one of the best sports books of all time. Um, it's nominally a baseball story, and it's certainly rooted in what Pat admits is of basically being flaming out in the minor leagues, and not only sort of understanding that you know the end of the road for a professional baseball career was imminent, but also how it forced him to come to grips with himself, right? It's really more of a, a personal story and journey of understanding and evolution, if you will, um, and evolving as a, as a man, as a, as a, as a human, uh, understanding the, uh, uh, the, the limitations and, and the possibilities. Um, I, I, I'm not doing the book justice. If you have never read it, uh, it is uh, absolutely something that you should read. Uh, and we uh, are ecstatic to have Pat Jordan here to talk about not only that story, um, but what came after that story, which was hugely enlightening to me because Pat essentially went on as that book, A False Spring kind of hints, to be a prolific writer, mostly in the genre of sports, but frankly, broadly as well. Uh, a persistent uh, member of best of lists, uh, especially in long form magazine writing, when magazine writing was a thing. I mean, you look up his uh, writings for Sports Illustrated and Men's Journal and uh, all kinds of other sort of long form publications out there. Uh, it, you will uh, uh, be amazed uh, at not only the uh, uh, the brusque, uh, uh, direct, uh, rough around the edges writing style, um, and you'll hear it in, in Pat's voice, right? Quite irascible still at 80 years old and, and then some 80 years young, frankly, Um just a, a, a one of uh, I would argue America's uh, a best and um, a most insightful. Uh, let's call him sports writer, but I would argue that's uh, maybe underselling because it's it's far broader and bigger uh, in terms of his insight uh, than just quote unquote sports. But uh, this is a, 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 a an amazing conversation. We bounce all over the place, but you will be rewarded by sticking with it because. Uh, in no particular order, <laughs> we're going to talk about things and people and places uh, like like Tom Seaver, for example. A brand new book came out just a year and a half ago, I think, which is new enough for us. Um, a, a lifelong uh, relationship with Tom Seaver. The book is called Tom Seaver and Me. Um, is uh, uh, it makes an appearance in this conversation. Joan Joyce, uh, as a, a legendary softball player. Uh, helped co-found the uh, Women's Professional Softball League with uh, one of our former guests, the late, great Dennis Murphy, back in the in 1976, and still coaching softball today, I think, at, uh, down at the University of South Florida, USF, if I'm not mistaken. Um, certainly, Milwaukee Braves uh, players uh, will be uh, discussed. Ted Klazuski uh, in the mix there. Joe Torre makes an appearance. Um a lot of women's sports stuff. Mary Jo Pepler, Pepler, if uh, you remember that name from our conversations around the International Volleyball Association, she also the winner of the Women's Superstars. Um, uh, Pat's got some opinions about Will Chamberlain, a, a topic and a person that we've uh, gone quite deeply into previously. We talk about Renee Richards and and Mike Veck, uh, the son of Bill Veck, and and Charlie Sheen and Isla Borders, and uh, it, we, uh, it's an amazing. Uh, just a, a phalanx of names and stories and insight about sports and life in general. Um, it is uh, it's a it's a wondrous conversation. Uh, it's not just about a false spring, the book that you must read about his uh, travails 
in the minor leagues of the of the then Milwaukee Braves, but just life in general and sports uh, as it applies to it. Uh, coming up with a uh, just a, a, a hair raising conversation. Uh, with the great uh, sports author uh, extraordinaire, Pat Jordan, coming up in a few moments' time. You will enjoy this. Trust me. Uh, before we get there, let's uh, uh, say hello and um, uh, doff our, uh, uh, our flannel baseball cap in the general direction of one of our great sponsors. How about this week, Ebbets Field Flannels? I think that's appropriate. Uh, Ebbets.com. And remember, you spell Ebbets E B B. E-T-S. So that's two B's, one T. E-B-B-E-T-S dot com. Ebbets Field Flannels. Uh, if you don't know what Ebbets Field Flannels does, go to the website. You will Your jaw will drop at the high level of quality and impressive authenticity around all kinds of sports uh, garb, uh, especially and uh, originally from uh, birthing now lots of different sports, but Baseball. That's the, the heart of it, uh, EbbetsFieldFlannels.com. Uh, and one thing you could do to sort of celebrate this episode and remember the Milwaukee Braves and then some is to go to Ebbetsfield Flannels uh, website and check out, say, the Wichita Braves for a number of years, the AAA affiliate. The 1957 vintage ball cap is yours there for a, a handsome price and a lovely and gorgeous looking W with the Braves colors of blue and red. Uh, the Jacksonville Braves. Uh, of 1953, they were part of the uh, extensive uh, minor league uh, baseball uh, system of the Braves. Um, it's where Henry Aaron got his start. Uh, he was at Eau Claire, the Eau Claire Braves, where Pat Jordan played. Uh, Jacksonville was, uh, I think it was part of the, the Class A um, uh, division. And um, uh, it just and there's a gorgeous, of course, uh, and I'm sort of understand this is the Milwaukee Braves 1957 authentic jacket. If you really want to commemorate the Braves championship season, that's uh, that's the item to have. And it's absolutely gorgeous. And uh, <laughs> you will be uh, just uh, overwhelmed at just how gorgeous and authentic that looks, too. And that's just uh, the tip of the iceberg, if you will. It's Ebbets Field Flannels. Again, it's Ebbets.com, E-B-B-E-T-S. Dot com And, oh, lest I forget, a promo code for you. You're going to save some bucks. You're going to save 10% off all of your purchases at Epic Field Flannels when you use the promo code GOODSEATS10. GOODSEATS10, the number 10, one zero, at ebbets.com. Thank you uh, to Jerry and friends at Ebbets Field Flannels. We love you and uh, all that you do, and uh, we appreciate your sponsorship of this show. All right. Let's get into it. All right. Buckle up for safety because this is a wild ride uh, and uh, cover your ears because uh, he's going to lay it out for you. Uh, a fascinating, wonderful and uh, intriguing uh, and, and thoroughly entertaining conversation. Here it comes. Our conversation with Pat Jordan. We talk about a false spring, the Milwaukee Braves and a whole lot more. Here it is. Please, as always, enjoy. One of the problems for me doing sit down is um, uh, I talk like even now talking to you, I walk around. No, we you know, love like, that. That's great. We love to walk around because life is like that. So I'm, I'm OK. Yeah, with I mean, I don't like I don't. The only time I sit down is to write, in, you know, without any distraction. But when I talk on a telephone, the first thing I do is get up. Either I go outside if it's a nice day and I start walking back and forth on the porch or uh you know, or in the backyard. <laughs> and that's one of the problems with the last guys who did me. They, they claimed I bounced around in the chair. You know, the NBC guys, and uh, they said I was too mobile in the chair. I was, you know, they weren't quite getting me right. So I said, I, I'm, I can't stand still. Hey, I don't, I'm I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you can walk around, you get in a car, I, you know, you want to drive an ice cream truck, whatever you want to do. I, I'm, I'm cool with it. I, just, as long as you, uh, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just excited to, to, to talk with well, you. Well, my, my, my publisher said, he said, he told me to uh, do the Zoom and Skype, he said, because that'll get you more play. I mean, like w looking at an 81 year old guy, I don't think that's going to draw in readers. So, so, I mean, look, podcasts, right? The, this uh, the, this uh, show is we've been doing this for four plus years or so, and and it's only, it was yeah. sort of a personal exploit of uh, probably, I guess, psychologically abandonment, right? So, uh, it, which is it seems like it's actually become somewhat of a theme here. 
But, you know, I, growing up uh, watching certain sports teams when I was a kid, uh, some of them uh, and leagues uh, going away. In particular, for me, it was uh, yeah. soccer and, and, and the North American Soccer League and the Cosmos and New York. Um, and uh, and then sort of stumbling onto like, well, this is kind of a thing. Like, uh, what is this yeah. United States Football League and the World yeah. Football League and on all that stuff? And, you know, uh, open the door and there's so many stories there that nobody seems to be yeah. talking about or well, remembering. There's a lot so. of sports. They don't do them in they don't, they don't do them in magazines anymore. I mean, nobody does magazine stories really. I mean, I, I, I got a copy of Sports Illustrated from 1972, and I had a I used to do the bonus pieces in the back back of Sports Illustrated. You know, the magazine was 274 pages. It was a, it was a book. You know, now it's like a pamphlet. You know, you throw it. You, nobody even reads it. But when when I was doing it, I, they would tell, tell me, oh, your limit is 7,500 words for a, a, a profile. I'd write 8,500, 9,000, whatever. They'd cut it down to about 8,000. But that's how I, be, I began, you know, with Sports Illustrated. I mean, it takes me 500 words to get a lead. Well, look, and, and actually, that's something we have nominally in common. So I uh, spent a little bit of time at Sports Illustrated one summer in college. Uh, actually, got to write a couple of pieces with some bylines, which is at the time sort of a highlight of my career. But but that was still around the time. This is nineteen eighty seven. That was well, still yeah. A- it was still it was still a magazine. I think then correct eighty seven. Yeah. Mark Mulvoy uh, was editor in chief at that time. Uh, um, uh, the late Bambi Wolf, uh, 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 wife of. Um, um, oh, I can't remember his name now. Uh, also, Wolf. Uh, yeah. You have a, you had you had uh, things called fact checkers or reporters. They literally oh, and yeah. that, was, that was that was my job as an intern slash writer, right? You had to you had to call call right. Dodger Stadium just to actually ascertain there was a thing called a Dodger dog because somebody wrote that right. story. Well, I, I, my first editor was Ray Cave, and uh, he Legendary. was a big deal there. And uh, uh, Andre Laguerre was there. This is a funny story. I was only a kid. I was 30, but I just started writing. So I, I, I never met, a, you know, Ray was my man. And then the, the girl who took over afterwards was Pat Ryan, who, who founded People. So Ray, <laughs> Ray said, whatever you do when you walk down the halls, don't say hello to Andre Laguerre. Now, Andre Laguerre was a... Uh, OSS guy in the Second World War, you know, the guy that they dropped it behind the enemy lines uh, from a plane. Yeah, a, a per- real perfect, old perfect, warrior. Per- perfect for a Sports Illustrated uh, employee. Right, and, and his name was Laguerre, the war. So anyway, <clears throat> he's a grouchy old guy. Nobody talked to him. So I'm walking down the hallway one day with all these offices left and right, and Andre's coming right towards me. So I go, hey, Andre, how are you? He said, hey, Pat, hey, I really like that story about blah, blah, blah that you did uh, last month. He said, we got a guy, you're on something now, we got to get you on something again. I said, oh, I'm going in to see Ray, he's going to get me. So he said, good, I'll talk to him afterwards. So I go, and all the people's heads were coming out of the office doors. Who was talking to Andre Laguerre? Because nobody would talk to him. They were terrified of him. And uh, when I told Ray, he said, oh, I told you not to talk. I said, we had a nice conversation. And then he told me, well, there's one thing you can never do. Never present an idea for on a, on a train. I said, a railroad train. He hates them. I said, why? He said, because he used to blow them up in the Second World War. <laughs> well, I, look, there was definitely, uh, that was a time, right? Now, I was in there in the 80s, right, which is a little later. But still, I mean, th- that this is when... And this is a good segue, I think, right? This this is when magazines were, um, I would say, more literary per se. I mean, people at the New yeah. Yorker would still argue this; they, they still are. Well, okay, but uh, it was a it was a medium for longer form stories and telling. Uh, and in the realm of sports, right? Sports Illustrated, right? When I got assigned in this uh, internship thing to to go to Sports Illustrated, I I had I, you know it was like third on my list because I didn't think it w- I would ever get it. I mean, it was, the, yeah, it, was, well, it was that sort of essential to one's sports uh, understanding of life, right? And I was, I was there when they turned down John Cheever at Sports Illustrated. John Cheever wanted to write for them, and I, they had a meeting. I was in it about something else, and they, they started discussing him, and they said, no, we don't want him. And this is when he was a big deal at the New Yorker. 
I mean, the, the, the Sports Illustrated was the New Yorker of sports. And Ray, Ray's rule was anything that's tangentially related to sports, we can put it, we can make a connection to sports. So it doesn't have to be baseball, basketball, football. That's why I did Mary Jo Pepler. Like you mentioned, the uh, volleyball girl. Yeah, let's talk about her. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, we we've talked a little bit about uh, uh, the women's uh, then WBL women's basketball, which she played in, but also the International Volleyball Association when the superstars. Yeah, I read, I read yeah. the story over again after you mentioned it, and it was awful wordy. I mean, all I did was run a tape recorder and and then mused on it. But uh, she was a great girl. But you've shown a spotlight on, and again, you know, underreported women's professional sports. What intrigued you about her, and and why make her a subject then? Uh, because because she was because unknown, her, uh, and, it, and she won that super size thing. Yeah, yeah, okay. That, so that was the adjunct into the world of of. Yeah, I, I said, who is this woman? Nobody knows that. Nobody knew anything about her. First of all, nobody knew anything about volleyball unless you're in California or something, and. Uh, <clears throat> Then she wins the superstar thing, but it was a joke anyway. I mean, you got Cha-Cha Muldowney who raced the car. I mean, you know, I, I did a story on Cha-Cha, and, I mean, she wasn't an athlete in the strict sense of the word. You know, I mean, she's tough cookie because she would be in a drag strip car going 280 miles an hour, and she had to be strong. Then I did uh, Fabulous Mula, the lady wrestling champion of the world. A sort of fat woman with a lot of tattoos in those days. You know, they weren't beauty queens like they are today. And uh, Fabulous Moolah, you know, it was a phony, a phony wrestling deal then, you know, where I, she, I had to leave her room, a hotel room in New York, because her opponent for the match was coming in and they were going to talk about it. You know, talk about it. What do you mean talk about it? Like who's going to fall where and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, Mary Jo Pepler, and then when I, I started to read about her, she was a real athlete. <clears throat> the only athlete, female athlete that I ever met greater than Mary Jo Pepler was Joan Joyce, the softball pitcher, fast pitch softball pitcher. And she lived in Waterbury, and I lived in Fairfield when I signed my bonus with the Braves. And she came down to a uh, signing of a, a, at a sports, sporting goods store. And I, I was asked to sign stuff there, too. I was 18 years old. So I'm in there, and there's this broad with a shirtwaist dress on, and she's got a glove in her hand, and she's pounding a ball into it. And I said, who's, who's that? She said, oh, that's the other great pitcher out of Connecticut, Joan Joyce. And I never knew anything about her. However, she had a long career, and she used to pitch against men's teams. And she would, uh, Joni, would strike out uh, 19 and 20 out of 21 girls. And when she switched to the men's team, she struck out 14 or 15. And uh, his, she got bored with basket, uh, softball, so she became a, a basketball player, AAU. First came out, she scored 63 points. She played a year, she didn't like that. So she became a golfer at 39, and she made the tour. And somebody said to her, geez, was it hard, Joni? She said, what's hard about it? The ball isn't moving, you know? She said, so anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, and I'd jo like jo Joan Joyce is still with us, and and and, and she, uh, for our you know for our really astute listeners, right? Deb, she was she even had yeah. Yeah, the the Ray Bestis break gets uh, on, yeah. on on the uh, amateur front, but she was also part of. So uh, uh, co-founding, uh, at the time, the Women's Professional Softball League in 1976. Right. But um, she's also in that super, uh, the woman's superstar thing. There you go. And, and we talked— Joan was not an agile girl. She was a very big, blocky girl, muscular, you know, thick legs and all that. So, I mean, she, there were some sports she might have—some uh, of those competitions that involved strength, she would be su successful, but not uh, agility like Mary Jo Pepler. I mean, she was a, Mary Jo was a, a tall girl. She wasn't she wasn't heavy. She was muscular, lightly muscular. But I mean, she was graceful as hell. When I played basketball against her, I mean, she was quick, agile. She was a real athlete. And uh, she should have been a track track girl. You know, she should have been some kind of track 
running or uh, jumping or anything like that. She was a great jumper, obviously, in, in volleyball. But I, I was fascinated by those girls, you know? Yeah, I and, mean, and uh, I, I guess the question there is, of of the, you know, and this is where women's sports were much more, uh, shall we say, categorized and, and, and cordoned off, I guess, from the quote-unquote mainstream of, of yeah. sports for whatever reasons, right, culture or whatever. But th- what was it about these two particular women that stood out enough for the sort of long-form treatment? Because I mean, in the case of Joyce, right, she's I, was she kind of a modern day Babe Diedrichson, perhaps, right? But but there's well, oh, she was uh, she was she was. I think Joan Joyce was the greatest female athlete in the history of sport because she's go, she could go from one sport. She's the only woman in her sport. No woman in track could compete against a man, or in basketball or anything. Joan Joyce was the only woman in her sport, softball, that when she switched to the men's team, she was just as good. Nobody could make that leap. You know, I, I mean, Joan was, uh, she, and she was a good friend of mine. We used, to, we used to talk all the time. She smoked, drank beer. I said, well, does the smoking bother you? She said, well, you're an athlete. You're supposed to smoke cigarettes. You're supposed to drink beer. <laughs> One time, this is a funny story. She pitched a game. In the 19th inning, it was nothing, nothing. I don't know how many strikeouts she had, 30-something. Nothing, nothing. She hadn't given up a hit or anything. And the umpires wanted to call the game. And they called them out to the, they went out to the mound with Joan. We want to call the game. We're afraid the girls are going to get too tired. And and Joan went ballistic. She said, you're not calling this fucking game. She said, I'm playing pitching on here until somebody wins it. You think I'm going to walk off the mound because you think we're tired? That was the end of that. Well, I, I love that because, I mean, she's, uh, if, according to my notes, she's still the softball coach at the Florida Atlantic University. And, and, and yeah, I was there. Going when I pitched in Waterbury, she was the one who gave me a pep talk before I went up there. I was going to her hometown, Waterbury. And uh, this was when I was 56. Uh, a, a nice Tuesday. I wrote that book about it. Uh, pitching a double A up there, and I was really nervous about it. <clears throat> I'd gotten in shape, and I'd been throwing for about a year. But I, I, the only one who would know was Joan, because there's only two people, two pitchers I ever talked to that I thought were real pitchers, and that was Tom Seaver and uh, who could articulate what they did, and Joan Joyce. If Joan Joyce had ever met Tom Seaver, they would have been like looking in the mirror. You know, they were both identically devoted to what they were doing, thought about it, disciplined, organized, all that. So I figured I'll talk to her. So I go down there. We're sitting outside uh, at uh, Florida Atlantic. She's smoking a cigarette. I'm smoking a cigar. And what are you worried about, Pat? She says, you're a, she says, you're a fucking pitcher. You're not going to forget it. It's like a bicycle. Relax. Go out there and have fun. And so I did. Uh, I, I got, you know, I pitched an inning, struck out the cleanup hitter, fucking guy. So I threw a fastball up and in on him, and he uh, followed it off. Then I threw him down the middle. He took it. So now he's figuring he's looking for another fastball. I gave him a slider. I had a, I had a major league slider at that time, and he went down on one knee. With one the bat out of one hand, you know, struck him out. The fans went wild. The only game they ever had there where the pitcher was the oldest guy in the ballpark. They took the ages of the people who came in. Anyway, Joni, to, Joni helped me out a lot with that. All right, well, I let, digress. What no, else no, do you want? No, no digression there, because actually it's a pretty good segue maybe to it's kind of the, the beginnings of this. So... You're hinting at it, and for those who uh, don't know uh, Pat Jordan uh, from his uh, uh, just uh, tome of, of legendarily— uh, you mean the, the books great... of mine that are in the dustbin of sports history? <laughs> no, it's, it, we'll get to that. Don't worry. It's, not, it's hardly that. Um, but I, I want to go to the origin story, right? Because you didn't—as you hinted, you know, with Sports Illustrated starting at 30, right? Seems like—that seems a little ancient 
when you think about, though, uh, however, the, the the prelude to that story, and and obviously that's sort of the the biggest underline for uh, our conversation as a window into the rest well, of it, right? But so just you didn't you were in high school, you were a phenom in baseball. Yeah, I got a, I got a fifty thousand dollar bonus with the Braves at a time when our our house was uh, I lived in my parents was a two uh, I think it was. Uh, Ten thousand dollar house, you know. Today it's like a half a million. So I got a fifty thousand dollar bonus. It was one of the biggest bonuses that year. And, uh, and I'm sorry. Let's back uh, up. Where, where was this? This is in Connecticut, I'm assuming. And yeah, Fairfield, Connecticut. How does this come about? Your your high school. Your your. Uh, when do you know you're really good? And and this is even in the realm of possibility for you. Eight fucking years old. I was the first eight-year-old ever to be on the Little League varsity. At nine, I was the best pitcher in the league. At 10, people were coming from 100 miles away to see me pitch. At 11 and 12, the place would be packed. In my, my last year of Little League, I pitched six games, and I struck out every batter except two. So I... I had two game, four games where I struck out 18 batters, which is six innings, Little League, and two games where I struck out 17. And both of the other outs were bunt, att- bunt attempts. So uh, I pitched four consecutive no-hitters. And then I go into high school. The first game I pitched as a freshman, I struck out 15 batters and uh, bro- uh, broke a state record. No, what am I saying? Not 15. I struck out 19, 19 out of 21. And I, that night a scout called me from uh, Cincinnati Reds. John, I can't remember his name, an old timer. And he offered me $20,000 over the phone. At what age? I, him, I was 15, 14. 1450. Playing, I just turned playing 50. for, the, playing for the, the the Jesuit order at Fairfield Prep. He he found you. Right, right. I was I was fourteen. I just turned fifteen, and he offered me twenty thousand dollars. I said, but I'm only a freshman. And he says, uh, or sophomore, I'm freshman or sophomore. He says, uh, oh God, don't tell anybody I offered this money. I could get fired because you know that would be tampering for you weren't supposed to. He thought I was a senior. So, uh, and I had uh, two really good, two or three really good years at prep. Then my last year, I was just, I was, you know, I was just really good, but not as good as I had been as a junior and a sophomore. Uh, I had, uh, they didn't, I never told anybody, but I got in a fight with a kid in, in class at prep. Fucking guy was always on my case. He was a football player, and he he was always saying I was a coward because they wanted me to play quarterback for prep. And I used to laugh at him and say, "Well, I'm going to go to play quarterback. I'm going to get a big bonus. I'm not going to hurt my arm playing football." And they'd say, "Well, you got to do it for the prep." I said, "Fuck the prep." I said, "Once I get out of here, nobody's going to even know who I am at the prep anymore." So I wouldn't play football, so he was constantly aggravating me, and so we got in a fight. And I, I think I locked my elbow. You know, you know how it might have, might have been dislocated or something. Sure. This is during the basketball season, and uh, I couldn't bend my arm, and I was terrified. I didn't tell anybody, and I, I couldn't bend it. And then one day I was playing basketball, trying to, uh, there was a pop. And all of a sudden I could bend it. This was like in December, January. And I thought, okay, it's, it's all right now. But I was never the same since. Uh, I was, I was, I got, I was wild in the minor leagues. Uh, I threw hard, but I was never the same pitcher. And I never told that story to anybody. Well, breaking news all these years. Well, but that doesn't that doesn't though prevent you from still being scouted and uh, essentially recruited, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I was still striking out fourteen guys a game, but I struck out nineteen the first game I ever pitched. Well, so you're becoming a mere mortal now versus sort of yeah. I was a mere great mortal. 
you know, I mean, uh, there was another kid who was just as good as me, Johnny Papa. He might have been better. Uh, he signed with the Orioles for about forty or fifty thousand. Uh, he, he, good kid, and, and Papa was uh, not Pappas, Papa. Not, not, not like uh, the Baltimore Oriole pitcher, although Johnny Papa did play with the uh, Orioles for one game. <clears throat> uh, we pitched a game. There were 10,000 people in the stands in a high school game. He was a senior. I was a junior. I beat him one nothing in eight innings, but he pitched a better game. He lost, it on a, he won, lost the game on an error. He struck out 14. I only struck out 10. And uh, he had a good fastball, straight as a string. Johnny Papa's story. I remember all this shit. When you get old, you can't remember what you had for breakfast. I love you remember it. the past. I, I keep going. I love it. So I, anyway, so uh, what the hell? You know, see, I just forgot what I was going to tell you. That's right. Johnny well, Papa. Let me listen. Let me, let me, so I, oh, I know what I was going to tell you. Ted Klazuski. He, he, he goes to the big leagues. They bring him in as a relief pitcher. Now he's got BBs. Ted Kozuski's an old man. His muscles are getting a little fat. You know, he's getting fat. He's an old man. So the, I don't know who the man is. I think it was uh, Weaver, Earl Weaver, told him. He said, don't do anything but throw this guy high fastballs. He can't get around anymore. So Johnny gets two strikes on him. <laughs> and he wants to prove he's a pitcher. So he throws him a straight changeup. Kluzowski puts it out into, I think it went into Delaware someplace, you know. And the next, that night, Johnny was back on the train to Rochester. Uh, but I could understand it. You know, when you're a fastball pitcher, you go to the big leagues, they, they all murder fastballs. No, they don't. They murder half fast fastballs, but they don't murder good fastballs. So anyway. why don't you, well that's okay well that that speaks volumes I guess about the the uh, the nuances of what makes a decent pitcher or or a good pitcher versus a, a great one so describe to me so we're talking 1959 the summer of 59 yeah when when you're so describe to me the Braves organization why that one stood out to you and or became the place in which you came from uh, went into and just the whole mindset of like committing to this, right? So you're saying no to a. To I was going to go to the best. The, whoever yeah. paid the most, I didn't give a shit. But I you, wanted, you I wanted to get the most money at that time. You were thinking I, I, this was something I was. Oh, I did do. college for my father. I wasn't. I didn't want to go to college. You know, I, I wouldn't. I went a half a year for, uh, I think, four years. It took me like eight years to get out of college because I went full time after I got out of baseball. But I. Um, <clears throat> The mindset. The, or the Braves were not on my radar. I, w I wanted to be a Yankee. Number one, I'm Italian. My father was Pasquale Michele Giordano. And he changed the name four days before I was born, so I'd be born with an American name. So I was Italian. Where were all the Italians? With the Yankees. Rizzuto and Crisetti and Barra and Rashi. So they were our team. And... They offered me 36000 and we were very disappointed, and, you know, because I, basically this was going to be the money that was going to protect me in case I didn't make the big leagues. I would at least have a bankroll. So we got more with the Braves, so that's who I signed with. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a bad organization, but it was very Southern. A lot of redneck guys didn't like northern guys. Like I had a manager, Billy Smith, I think he's from South Carolina, where I happen to be living now. And he didn't like the Dago, he said. So uh, one year I was supposed to go with his team at Boise, and Boise was notorious for the light air. And pitchers would have earned run averages of like six and win 18 games. And they were going to send me there because they figured, uh, I, you know, with my fastball, a light air wouldn't be bad. If you were a curveball pitcher, you were in trouble at Boise. 
But if you're a fastball pitcher, the light air is gonna, not going to affect it. But uh, at the last minute, uh, Smith didn't want me. He said he had Joe Torrey was going to be the catcher. And I had a squabble with Torrey in uh, batting practice one day. And he was a pain in the ass. He had, he had the clout from having his brother, Frank, be with the team. You know, so in the minor leagues, he had the can't, can't miss thing. I had nobody in my corner, and Joe, and Joe had a lot of people in his corner. So anyway, we got in an argument, naturally ended up my fault. And so Smith says at a meeting, he said, I'm not going to have that red-ass guinea, red-ass guinea on my team. I thought he meant Tory. And then I found out he meant me. So I go to Davenport, the worst team in the Braves organization, and pitched great, ended up 6-12. and 12. But I led the whole Braves organization in strikeouts. So uh, and next year they tried to change my motion so I could throw the ball over the plate, and I got all fucked up. And that's why I became a writer. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's unpack a little bit of that. So uh, you're playing uh, in, you're assigned in the minors uh, for uh, the bulk or the entirety, pretty much, of your, your pro career. I'm assuming, though, you're getting looks anew every season in spring training, though, right? Uh, yeah, but the first year I went to spring training with the, uh, the Braves. Actually, I was, on, it was spring training in, in Bradenton. And I was, uh, you know, I pitched. I pitched well in the Nebraska State League. I mean, Jim Bowden was there, a couple other guys that went out to the big leagues, and I pitched better than them. Like I had more strikeouts, better ERA, less hits. I used to. I gave up like six hits a game, struck out ten, but I walked eight, and Jimmy didn't walk anybody. Uh, but. Uh, so I, I had a good year, good enough. It was a rookie league, but it was a good rookie league with a lot of bonus babies. And uh, so I go to uh, spring training. I pitched one, I think it was one inning, into squad game against the big league club. And I pulled a Johnny Papa, but I did it before Johnny Papa. They were trying to teach me a change-up in spring training. From the first game I pitched, I, I didn't know anybody. Uh, you know, I didn't know anybody on the, the rosters. And one of these guys was a Triple A guy, veteran Triple A guy, like he's thirty years old, left-hander, and he just got into camp, second day. So to show the Braves I was a pitcher, I pulled a Johnny Papa. I got two strikes on him. I threw him a changeup. He hit a home run. So that was that was my uh, spring training performance. Um, remind me or uh, or educate me. There, there's no draft to get you into the Braves. You're kind of being solicited, and you made a choice. Is that how it was working back in the late night? Yeah, there were no drafts in those days. The day you graduate high school, there are 16 cars parked in front of your house. 16 scouts sitting on the, sitting on the hood of their car, smoking cigarettes. Waiting for their turn. It would be it'd be like a, a cafeteria. One comes in, goes down the line, talks to my brother, father, mother, not me. They didn't even talk to me. And uh, then they're out the door after they make the offer. And then you pick the five best offers and you go to the ballparks. Yankees, Cincinnati. I went to Milwaukee. I didn't go to Chicago. But uh, Chicago was in New York, the White Sox. And, uh, and Greenberg was, I think, GM then. And he, was, he ushered me around. He was telling me what a great bunch of guys they were. And he had this guy, his redneck southerner in the locker room, Barry Lashman, I think it was. And then uh, Lashman, I think it was, a real redneck from South Carolina or someplace. And they had a, a Levy, a, it was the name, a pitcher, a, a, the Jewish pitcher on the team. I forgot who it was, which was rare. And Lashman used to rag the Jewish pitcher 
call for Mr. Levy, call for Mr. Levy. In other words, he was basically saying, call for the Jew, call for the Jew. Yeah. And finally, they got into it on the big bunch of guys they are. I couldn't, go, I couldn't wait to get out of that locker room. Ron Northey was a scout. He was famous for being a great pinch hitter. Wait. And I said, I'm out of here, Ron. I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with it. He says, Pat, I'm on an expense account. He said, at least let me take you to Gallagher so I can get a steak. He said, they won't honor it if I don't take you out. So I had to go there. I was all pissed off. And I had to go with Ron while he's pounding away at a big steak. And all I wanted to do was get home. When, when did you, when did you, uh, so how did, how does the end come? And then, uh, and then I'm also very curious as to what you think you want to do next. Like what, when do you know that this the, the dream, it's a dream, right? And, and you've got the talent, you know how difficult it is. You see it up close. When do you kind of know that this is probably not going to happen for me? When you get released twice in two years. And then you try to do it on the, the local level back home in the senior city league, and you can't get, and can't throw the ball anywhere. I was, you know, I was a mess that last year. I think it was Palatka, Florida. My motion was all screwed. I was one of those guys who forgot how to pitch, like Steve Blass and uh, the, the kid for the Cardinals recently, uh, a couple of years, not a couple of years ago, five years, ten years ago. The kid for the Cardinals who pitched in the playoffs, the left-hander, got great stuff from Jupiter, Florida. What the hell was his name? Anyway, he, he forgot how to pitch. So that was the thing. It was all mental. They sent me to shrinks and everything. They told, they told me I think too much. Well, which... I said, oh, okay, I'll be a writer then. <laughs> yeah, well, that, I mean, yeah, it's a compliment, but also a curse, right, for something that is so, you know, repetitious and... Oh, I, I got to tell you this. Well, I had this minor league pitching coach, a real pain in the ass, Gordon Maltzberger. And then he'd always, always come to town. He'd work with the pitchers who were 10-0 and 0 because he wanted everybody to think that he was responsible for them being 10-0. and 0. When he should have been working for the pitcher, pitchers like me who were 6-12 and 12 and just needed a little control or something, but he never even noticed me. So one one day one day he finally tried to work with me and he told me to do something with my arm level. I said why? He said because I said so. I said why? Because you said so. This went on. It was like who's on first? He would ask me to do something. I said why? You don't ask why in, in baseball. You just do it. It's like the army. And I spent it up and. The next 40 years of my life asking why to everybody I ever talked to as a sports writer, you know. All right, People say, how, how, how hard was it? Everybody had written about Tom Seaver. I said, it's easy. You just read all the clips, and you just look for the questions that nobody asked. And the one question nobody asked is the why. So that would be, that would be my thing when I was interviewing people. Some people would be shocked, you know, like, that's personal. I said, well, you shouldn't be doing a story. But in uh, in those days, people wanted publicity. Like, Tom was making, like, 70000 something like that. And if he got a nice story in Sports Illustrated, maybe he would get a Pepsi commercial for 10000 And that was a big deal for him. Today, guy's making $40 million, he needs a Sports Illustrated writer up his ass like he needs a hole in the head, you know? Well, I, so before, nobody gets access. Well, I, I want to get to that segue. Right? Before we leave the Braves, though, I just want to ask you one sort of last sort of question on that. Yeah. So <clears throat> you're part of an organization, right, that um, depending on your read of history, and I wasn't there and you were, uh, was going through at least some motions of eventually leaving Milwaukee. Did you get any? I didn't know anything about that. Okay. Did, and, I was nowhere near Milwaukee. I, I, I went there, worked out in Milwaukee, was there three days with Warren Spahn. I got signed the contract. I get on a fucking airplane to McCook, Nebraska. It was a puddle jumper. It made like 10 stops before it ended up in McCook, Nebraska. But it didn't end up in McCook. It ended up in Kearney. And all my luggage was shipped to Denver with all my money in it. Not, not the 50 foul. But, I mean, I had a couple hundred dollars I put in my luggage. 
And so I had no money to even pay the taxi from, uh, no, it was, yeah, no, it wasn't Kearney, it was North Platte. And it was like 85 miles of McCook. I got a taxi. I said, how far is McCook? He said, oh, it's down the road a piece. <laughs> if those people, 85 miles was a, you know, a little jog. And uh, we go 85 miles, I don't know what the, what the bill was, so I had to get my manager to pay the bill, Bill Steinecke. <laughs> But but you didn't but you didn't sense though there was no being part of the organization though you you didn't get any sense that I mean I I'm wondering like is it because it was a change in ownership in sixty two sixty three or so right yeah they went from uh, they went from uh, the Italian which is one of the reasons my mother wanted me to sign with them Perini Lou Perini wasn't he I think so yeah and then they got uh, somebody else and they got I think they got all the Irish like you in there. Bill Bathar- uh, Bartholomew back in yeah right. Uh, uh, no, and, this, and if, when I was there, it was Lou Perini was the manager, uh, the owner of the Braves. Right. Oh, right. Fair enough. Yeah. And then they then they they changed and it became sort of a Irish Southern organization. A lot of Southern coaches, and they were the reason is because the kids in the Northeast were a lot hipper about what they wanted to do with their lives. And if they were a good athlete in the Northeast, you knew enough to get the money. The guys in the South, you know, they had to, they had no hope at all. There were no jobs down there in those days. And so they, being a baseball player was their only way out. It's like working in the mines, you know. So the Braves could sign those guys for nickels and dimes. Braves had one year, we had 14 minor league teams. They had four Class D league clubs. So you could move up four times that year and still be in Class D. Jeez. They had, uh, uh, let's see, Midland, which was the top D team. They had uh, McCook, which was the rookie league. Then they had a team in New York Penn League, Penn State League, I think, or New York Penn League. And then uh, where the hell was the fourth team? Uh, I don't remember the fourth team. But you could you could move up four times and still end up in D ball. They had fourteen teams. There were there were so many guys running around. It was like a military base in spring training. What, was that baseball out, or, or was that the Braves? So that, that's what I'm sort of getting. Because I don't know. I was, I was on the organization I was with. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know okay. what the Yankees did. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, because I mean, you know, I know how it was with the Braves. They, the Braves' attitude was sign everybody, throw them all out, and see who comes to the surface. You know, I mean, spring training was a mob. I, I mean, we would, we were in uh, Waycross, Georgia. It was a military base that they turned into, you know, Quonset huts and all. And it was way out in the swamps, Okefenokee swamps. And, uh, you know, we could, unless you had a car, you couldn't go into town, which is what the Braves liked. It. You know, you couldn't leave. And uh, no girls, no booze. Except if you had a car, <clears throat> and uh, I mean, it was, it was it was it was really just like being in the army, and uh, you, all you do is play baseball, talk baseball, or in my case, obsess over baseball, which didn't help. You know, you had no other outlet. All right. Well, let's talk about your gear shift then. So you're you you you're you're unceremoniously out of baseball. Um, I, w- what do you do next? And what's going? Okay, I'll head? tell you what you do. First of all, you don't leave your room for three months because you're embarrassed to go around town. Everybody's the the big the big deal guy who couldn't make it after three years, and they threw him out. So you're you're embarrassed. You you know that you were a failure. It's the first failure of my life, right? And uh, finally you come out and you go to one of the senior city league games where you used to be a star and there's some old fucking cronies, you know, the old timer guys like the three witches in Macbeth, <laughs> double, double, bu- bubble, bubble, boil in trouble or whatever the fuck. <laughs> uh, and they're talking, I'm standing behind them. They don't know I'm there. 
Say, oh, I heard Jordan's back. He never had the guts to make it. I knew he couldn't make it and all that. That was the last baseball game I went to. I fled and went home. And the next day I got a job digging ditches on a construction crew. And that lasted for a couple months. And I got a job as a mason laborer. That's the toughest job in the world. And uh, a guy used to build three-story homes in Fairfield County, chimneys, and a fucking uh, uh, scaffolding he used. He never paid attention to it. It would wobble. And he, he was in a cast from his hip to, to his uh, foot because he fell off the third floor. And so all he could do was get up the ladder and stay there, and I had to go up and down with cement and mortar and uh, bricks all day. Talk about getting in shape. You actually made that into a story in uh, later years in, yeah. in, in 87 sure. for Sports Illustrated. Yeah, very famous. Sure. Story. Yeah. And uh, that, and then, uh, let's see. Then I finally said, Fuck this, I'm going back to college. So I went back to college, fair for you. I had only gone to like two semesters. And one year I didn't even go two semesters because I went to the Winter League. So after about three years, I had like one year of college. So now I went back, summer school and everything. And I was married then with a kid. I was living with my in-laws, they took us in. And I was working three jobs. And uh, the problem there was I was talking like a baseball player, you know, and they used to laugh at me because uh, the other kids were uh, intellectuals and I was a jock. And uh, still, still, I still am. The... Uh, uh, it's, it was, it's hard to shake. People say, you know, I, I, I swear a lot. They, they, some people think it's an affectation. They don't get. I grew up in the 50s. And when I was 12 years old, 13 years old, I was playing basketball with 18 year old guys at the North End Boys Club in Bridgeport, Connecticut, a tough place to play. And those guys had unbelievable language. You know, fucking talk, suck, motherfucker. But that's that's how they talked. So I talked like that. And then I go away to the locker room, and that's the way they talk in a locker room. So by the time I'm 22, I don't know how to talk like a civilized human being. You know. And uh, I never, I never did shake it because I never worked for anybody, so I didn't have to learn how to talk like a civilized human being. I mean, even today in this town I live in, this uh, Abbeville, where everybody's so polite and precious, they think I'm from Mars. Well, but okay, so, but before before you uh, before we have to rescue you from the depths of, of despair here, let, let let's let's. No, uh, I'm I'm thrilled. <laughs> I never I never had to be anything but what I wanted to be because I've only worked for myself. Well, okay. I was a baseball player for myself, and then I sixty three I started to write. Okay, so how then? Do you make that adjustment? Because it's not like you could just snap your finger and become arguably a prolific and very uh, uh, monumentally insightful writer, especially when it comes to sports. Okay. I did it the way I approached baseball. I got every magazine on the planet, every newspaper, read every book review, Saturday review, everything. Went through it with a red pencil underlining how writers did things, how they created a scene, how they dialogue, how they did this, how they did that. I read Hemingway, all, everything. Hemingway I love because, he, you know, he's the first 20th century writer. He's the first guy to say less is more. Uh, up until that point, more is more. And, uh, I mean, you know, he was mannered over the years. And it became a, a tickle with him, you know, sort of like a, the guy, David Mamet, writes the plays, well, oh, we've got to do the thing here, you know, who's going to get the thing, because this thing's got to work. And, uh, but I, that's how I did it, I approached it like that, and then I sent stories cold. 
you know, I found a lighthouse keeper, a woman lighthouse keeper, who had, uh, <laughs> this is a great fucking story. Uh, she, she was a daughter of the lighthouse keeper, old maid. They lived in the lighthouse, right on the point, in Bridgeport. And he dies. But she never bothered to tell anybody. And she put him in the basement, buried him in the basement, which was always cold. And she was the lighthouse keeper. But since nobody ever saw the lighthouse keeper, all the lighthouse keeper do is put the lights on and off. They never knew it. And then when she died, the lights went out, and then they discovered the old man's body. Great story. Anyway, I sold it to some New England magazine for like $75. And you, you have no connections. You're doing this all cold. What gave you the balls shall we say to to say that hey i i, I could actually i can write and get published and I didn't. at this I, 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 used to, I didn't know whether i could write but i knew i had i did everything i could possibly to learn how to write and uh i started doing this book about my baseball career with the braves and the the, the days of wine and bonuses i called it because <laughs> the days of wine and roses was had just been a movie with uh, sure. Jack, Lemmon. Jack Lemmon and uh, oh, I don't know who the girl was. Anyway, uh, about alcoholics. So I said, the day of wine and bows, wine had nothing to do with my career. So anyway, uh, I wrote it and sent it to Sports Illustrated. Ray Cave got it. He called me up and said, come on in, I'd like to talk to you. This is 1968, 7. Sounds right. So he calls me in. I think he's going to buy the book. So he talks to me. And he said, this is, this is not it. You, you're not doing it. He said, you're self-pitying, which I have a tendency for it anyway. He said, you're being self-pitying. He said, you've got to get more distance from it. He says, come back to it in two years. He said, here's a check, $400. Whenever you write the book again, the $400 is just to give it. It's just that you have to show it to us before you show it to anybody else. So... I began to write, and I kept writing and writing and writing. I didn't get back to the book until about 68, 69. I was almost, let's see, I was 28. And I think I finished the book in the early 70s. And I discovered the Braves didn't ruin my career. I did, and that's the book I wrote. And... Uh, the problem with that book was it came out after Jim Bowden's Ball Four. So now the, 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 the press was, oh, another washed-up pitcher wants to write a book about baseball. Now, I'm sure you read a Ball Four, right? Sure, of course. What does Ball Four have to do with the fall spring? No, they're com they're Nada. they're completely different, right? And and and, right. and and there's a reason why fall spring actually shows up on some of the best baseball, if not sports books of all time, alongside ball four. But that they are completely different stories and different. I know it, and and, and so the word was I was supposed to book I was book of the month club was going to make me a major selection, but they had uh, taken Roger Kahn book Boys of Summer. As a major selection, which was an eighty thousand, eighty-eight thousand dollar deal, which is a lot of money in those days, seventy-two. And Khan's book was the worst. No, it was the Dodgers book. Yeah, it was the, 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 the Boys of Summer. Was that his first book? Uh, I think. Yes, I believe so. But yeah, I mean, there's some stuff that was prior to that. Well, anyway, he did. He did the, the book tanked, so they said never a baseball book again. So now I got two things going against me. Khan's book tanked. For, uh, for a book of the month club and Jim Bowden wrote the baseball book about a pitcher so why read a, a book about a minor league pitcher who never made it so that was uh, that was my opening to salvo to my co career but, but 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 you do have the ear of the the New Yorker of sports right in Sports Illustrated so I'm, I'm assuming that Ray no Kane, money Okay, oh, fair enough, but 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 it's still you're on some radar of influence and importance even before this. I didn't think of it that way. Okay, I didn't think about it that way. I always wanted to write books. 
<clears throat> and uh, I've been writing magazine stories so long I could do it in my sleep. The worst thing I'm ever going to write is a B plus story. So you know, I used to get hired all the time. Uh, and you were you were freelancing everywhere, right? Oh, always freelancing. Sports Illustrated offered me twenty thousand dollars a year in 1971 or two. And ten thousand dollars expenses that if you don't use it as expenses, you can keep the leftover. And most of the guys were living off the ten thousand dollars expenses in '72. So I said, "Well, what's what's this, what's the setback? Do I have to come into the office?" They said, "Yeah." And now I lived in Connecticut, it's an hour ride on a train. And I said, oh, "No, no, no." I said, "It's not. It's not the hour." I said, "I'm not good around people." <laughs> I said, I'll, I'll get fired or I'll get in a fight. I said, you don't want me in the office. I said, I'll, I'll come in one or two times a week. So they capitulated. All right, I can come in one or two times a week. And I said, anything else? He said, yeah, we own everything you write. I said, whoa. You mean I don't have any control over what I write? They said, yeah, Time, Time Life owns it. That was a deal breaker. I never, I never worked for anybody. That the only, I almost worked for them. I would have been a millionaire today, and multi, and I refused to do it. So everything I write is right is mine. If you don't like it? Give it back to me. I'll sell it to somebody else. Right, and that's- my own agent. Never had an agent. But you have your voice, right? And and I don't think something yeah. I don't think something like a false spring um, comes out and has the impact that it does, regardless of your your perception of its sales and and the timing of it and stuff. Without that sort of fierce, independent, and unique sort of perspective, right? Versus it being, if shall we say, watered down or filtered in some other. Yeah, form. I, mean, I know. I mean, if I wrote five for Sports Illustrated, they they publish four. Episodes of, of of Fall Spring, of five, the most they ever ran of any author. In other words, while I was writing a Fall Spring, it was like Dickens. Every every, every time I finish a, a large chunk, they would publish it, and it was the most they ever had. And they they considered it the number one baseball book ever written until Mulvey took over, and Mulvey couldn't uh, didn't like me. I don't like him. And all of a sudden, I'm the 131st best baseball look, book in Sports Illustrated history, which is bullshit. Oh, is, is that when – so Mark Mulvoy was then the editor when that, that yeah. list came out of the best, best books of uh, uh, sports books? Yeah, they said the, – well, the first time they did it, uh, Fall Spring was number one. They didn't like uh, Bowden's book that much. Uh, you know, and then it's kept dropping every year. Bill James' is extract, what, is that a book? <laughs> what is it? I mean, are there people in it? Is there, is there tension? Is there, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, I'm talking about books. And, uh, and besides, Bowden didn't write the all four. Uh, Leonard Schechter did. Right, right, right. Did you know, you know that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Indeed, we we had. Yeah, yeah um, he did the whole book. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. Why do you think Bob never wrote another book? Leonard died. Yeah, but he did have that sitcom for a couple of episodes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's this? LinkedIn Jobs. Hey, these days, it can be hard to find and hire the right candidates for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs made it easier to find the people that you want to talk to faster and for free. Create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 770 million people. My goodness. Focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience and use screening questions to get your role in front of only the most qualified. Then use the simple tools on LinkedIn Jobs to quickly filter and prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. 
It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. Yes, that's it's no surprise, friends, that LinkedIn jobs helps you find the candidates that you want to talk to faster. Of course. Well, did you know that every week that nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Come on. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash good seats. That's linkedin.com slash good seats to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And now back to our conversation. A Fall Spring comes out in what, 73? Something like that. Okay. So what was... What was okay? First of all, number one, this is your first. I'm on a Today Show. Right, this is your first, first book, all. right? Yeah. Okay. No, the second book. Second book. First okay. book was uh, it actually was the third book, I think. The first book was Black Coach. I wrote in '70. It was about a black uh, football coach, black high school, who uh, moved on to the white high school, which was integrated '72 in Burlington, North Carolina. His name was Jerome Evans, a great guy. Died young of a heart attack. And uh, a life guy went down there to do a book, do the book. And he came back and said he, well, he was looking for Ku Klux Klan marches and crosses being burned on the lawn. Right? That was his idea of the book. And there wasn't any of that. <clears throat> it happened very, you know, it was very fluid. Uh, changeover from Jerome Evans as the football coach to the white redneck guy who moved to another town. And uh, so I go there for a weekend. I said, it's a great story. All these people, you know, it's, it's interwoven. You know, it was a, it was a real story. It was like a, a not to kill a mockingbird. That's a kid's book. But uh, the other one uh, with the with the reindeer, with the deer and the kid. Uh, what the fuck is that? I'm sorry, I don't remember. Who's he knows? The Earling. The Earling. Oh, sure, sure, sure. All about characters and, and, and people. There are some great characters on there. So I wrote a book about all the people who were involved with this big experiment. And it was a good book, especially the first one. And uh, what else? Yeah, you know, that book's worth a thousand dollars now. If you can find it on. Uh, well, I want to talk about that. Amazon. I want to talk about that aspect of it in a second. But but, but the reaction. Yeah, I don't get any of the thousand though. <laughs> well, I know that. Well, the the reaction to a false spring though was what for you and for people who heard the story, right? You basically said, okay, it was essentially about you more so than it was about the Braves. Braves had moved to Atlanta by that time, right? It was a different sort of sensibility. Yeah. Uh, so, wait a minute. The fifty-seven, they moved. Yeah. So what, what was 59, the, what was the what what's the reaction from baseball and frankly what's the reaction? I don't know. I didn't have any reaction from baseball. I was out of baseball. I was a, they knew me as a Sports Illustrated writer. A few guys read a Fall Spring. It's not a it's not a baseball book. You know, uh, I mean so, it's a, it's a, you know what it is. What I patented after I used to see it forty times. It's the last picture show. Great. I used to go to the last picture show five times a week to see how he did it. The mood, the ambiance, the, you know, the whole way he set it up, black and white. It was a black and white film. And I saw what he did. It was a, it was a nothing story, last picture show, but it was a great story. So I thought of a fall spring as a baseball last picture show. You know... The, where where the, the times and the people were more important than any conflict or and a lot of, it wasn't a lot of people's but a lot of people didn't like me as, a, as the character in the book and I knew precisely what I was doing I was presenting myself warts and all as if to say here we all are you know like I was every man I wasn't I didn't. I used to make myself look worse. For example, at one point in the fall, spring, there were two or three guys were talking to some girls in McCook, Nebraska, where I was. I was 18, and uh, I thought I'd be the big smart guy. And I went over and I said to them, "Who are these cunts?" And right, 
But that never happened. I went over and said to him, who are these girls? But I wrote cunts in the book hmm. because I was an uncouth kid. And I wanted, to, I wanted to portray this kid as being somebody who was not that pleasant, which I wasn't. But it didn't bother me. You know, uh, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to get it right. Yeah, I mean, you're and, speaking uh, your this is this is speaking a truth that was essentially your story and how how you've got right. To, right. You, you can't write about people unless you're harder. I, I, I always have this thing: you can't write about people and be easy on yourself. You know, like a, I write a story that somebody wants to sue me, like Garvey's or something. Then I can't turn around and sugarcoat me. And I started that with the fall spring, which is one reason I never really got to be a well-known or money, money-making book writer, because there was always an edge that made people uncomfortable no matter what they read. You know, I was never the hero in the books. I was always the anti-hero or the, the fuck-up, you know. And uh, that's where I was. You, you mentioned so, last. You mentioned last picture show. Did, did you ever talk about? Uh, was there any interest in ever sort of trying to maybe take the take the book and convert it into a film, uh, like a Bogdanovich type? <laughs> oh, I got a story for you. Go for it. <laughs> the fall spring was optioned by these two guys. I go in there. They wanted to option it out. And I go in there. Sterling Lord set me up with that agent they got boxes all around cardboard boxes i said you guys i said are you guys moving in or moving out he said we're not sure yet (laughs) i should have known then so they said oh we we read this book it's fabulous and all that did you ever think of being making a major character a spade revolutionary on a college campus (laughs) i said absolutely i've been working on that yeah give me the book I'll, i'll go home and do it that was the end of my anybody wanting to buy a full spring. That's are you still I, there? Yo, I, I still. It's interesting. I mean, I, the fact that um, it's so you know well received and well regarded, um, and and yet you know in this day and age you you'd think that a story like this would be. I mean, I it, with all due respect, it's all nuance. Yeah, nuance, but also there's all nuance and no and no um, uh, and no climax action. Yeah, but you know, you know lesser, what I mean. It's like lesser, the last picture let, show. Lesser projects have made the big screen or the small screen or the streaming. Sure, they have, right? But not but generally by people who have money or can get money. But a book like a Fall Spring is going to have to have somebody absolutely devoted to it, or somebody who has enough money to do it. And one of the problems was when Fall Spring came out, there was a little talk about it, but there were no actors. The Fonz, uh, uh, Richie Cunningham, those are the those are the young Hollywood actors. You know what I mean? Today, all the young actors are edgy. Or the, over the last thirty years, you know, uh, they're edgy, and uh, yeah, even the, even the girl actresses are. You know, I mean, you, you see, fifteen, uh, twenty-year-old girls, eighteen-year-old girls acting today. They're like tough. Professional, you know they don't make, they don't play cupcakes anymore. And but when you know when I when I did a fall spring, every you know it was a Lou Gehrig story. You know oh, how, what a great great guy he was. Uh, it's always it's always had to be a phony uplifting sports story. Jackie yeah, Robinson, hagiography of sorts, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Paul Spring was not that. So, so the reason you... Fort Spring is, is staying around is because the, the, the mentality of people reading about sports or read, just reading it all changed to become edgier and edgier. And the more edgier, more edgy it becomes, the more sports of, of Fall Spring becomes popular because it was an, it's an edgy book. I mean, the, does anybody watch the Lou Gehrig story anymore? Or, uh, you know, some of those schlock uh, the football. Babe, how, about the, how about the Babe Ruth story? Jeez. <laughs> God. Jesus Christ. I, I, what are you, 
hot dogs and uh, milk he used to drink. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, in essence, you know? in many respects, you were kind of ahead of your time in that in that sort of genre. Yeah. Was just, in yeah. A, yeah. Well, let I'm me. Always, I'm, always either, I'm always ahead of it. I once, I once, at the New York Times Magazine, I had a contract, and they didn't ever let me do politics because I was conservative, you know. And uh, I moved to South Carolina 10 years ago, 11 years ago. First thing I did is call them up. I want to do a story on Nikki Haley, governor of South Carolina. I said, who's she? I said, she's a woman. She's a woman of color. She's an immigrant. And she's a conservative. I said, and she lives in South Carolina, where the good old boys hate her. Because as far as they were concerned, she was a black, an immigrant. The conservative was all right, but she was a real conservative. You know, I mean, thought out. They wouldn't let me go near her. I wanted to do her for years. Now she, now they're talking about her running for president. They'll do her now if the Republicans nominate her. But, you know... Yeah, I mean, ten years ago, there's something to be said for that. I mean, in, in that, so you know, I, I, I've uh, I work in the sort of uh, media and tech space and stuff, yeah. and in the world of venture capital, right? It's you know, uh, being early in many respects is also looked upon it's as being, death. being wrong, right? And but yeah. but that that sort of nuance or that timing or that sort of spark of change outside that could change it, right? So it's it's. It's um, sometimes it's it's luck and timing more than anything else. You mentioned it with with the debut of your book, right? Coming out uh, in the the wake of, of a ball four and and the mis the the misinterpretation. Roger Kahn book, yeah. exactly right. So they, um, they killed me. Both of those books. They should, they, Bob and book killed me because he was a pitcher, and here I was a minor league nobody who wrote a wrote a, a book about a pitcher about the minor leagues. Who gives a shit? Khan's book killed me because it was a big popular book, supposedly. But who who would think there was going to be a big book about the Brooklyn Dodgers? And it wasn't. You know, I mean, I, I don't know whether he made any money off it. But, but I mean, how many Dodger fans? Not L.A., but, I mean, Brooklyn. It was, you know. Uh, so, anyway... Uh, well, look, and that's why I, that, that's why we commend not only this book, but but some of the other stuff. So, so let me, uh, and we could go forever on this, but let me let me ask you sort of one uh, sort. Let's maybe cul de sac this with. I want to get just touch upon. We don't have to go too deep, but a couple of uh, other works that sort of emanated uh, in the wake of all of that, which to me and our little genres like are really is fascinating yeah. stuff. Like so, for example, Broken Patterns, right? Which essentially oh, is. Oh, I love that. Well, that's it. So describe that. That's a, a, essentially like a collection of your of your work. Sports Illustrated me. pieces. That's when I got into my uh, do. See, I had a plan at Sports Illustrated. Uh, I knew what I was going to do. Number one, I was going to write about pitchers because I was a pitcher. So therefore, I can talk to pitchers, you know. Then number two, I was just going to do baseball. They wanted me to be a baseball writer. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to do day by day games. Then I was going to do just sports in general. Then I was going to do women athletes because that's a, that was going to catapult me out of the sports world into the the writing world of um, things that were not really tied to sport, like Mary Jo Pepler. You know what you know what I mean? Willie White, uh, fabulous Mula, Cha Cha Muldowney, Joan Joyce. It was about women. And women were not seen as athletes in those days. So basically, I was writing profiles of women. All of them happened to be successful in some kind of sport, but not really successful. Like Joan Joyce never made any money, and uh, Mary Jo Pepler didn't. Uh, Cha Cha made a couple of bucks. Fibus Mula, you know, she wasn't well known. So I wanted to show that I could write about things more complex than just sports in some respects so frankly, decided, you were more ahead of your you were again had ahead of your time right because of course now, i was right now everything is a big deal i i did uh venus williams before anybody knew who she was for the new york times devastating story about richard richard williams the father go Kim read it richard, go pick it up see if you can find it right 
But na- but or, or frankly, you see the movie or the the, the, the King Richard. Oh, give, right? give me a break. Well, I know, but I mean, it's it's uh, this is this is why your stuff is intriguing to me, and I think our audience for a lot of different you reasons. You can't do you can't do a movie on a guy like Richard. He's you know, he's not a good guy. So you know, so you want to do it. You know, the first words out of his mouth when he meets me was that we're in uh, West Palm Tennis Club where, where he was working out the girls. Uh, Venus was like 14 or 15, and the other one was like 12. And uh, he comes up to me with the two girls, his wife, or Orsine, and he shakes my hand. He said, I, now, don't get nervous being around so many black people. I look. I said, I grew up in a neighborhood with black kids. What do you, what do you mean? Don't be so nervous. What am I? You know, that was he's a con man. Uh, one, don't be so nervous about me. So I got pictures of me on the wall here when I was 15 years old in South Car in South Carolina. They, the guys come and they look and there. There's me, 15, 16, playing basketball against four black guys. And it wasn't a black team. It was a, an inner city team that had uh, more black students than white students. And the black kids were better basketball players anyway. So I said, no. I said, they said, geez, when was this? I said, 1957, 56. He said, oh, we, we never played basketball against black guys. I said, I lived in the neighborhood with them. You know, I was from Bridgeport originally. So, uh, you know, my, my mother used to tell me, my mother was a small, dark Italian woman, you know, bristly hair. She used to tell me we could never be, we could never be prejudiced against the blacks. She said, when Hannibal came over the Alps with his army, you know, the, uh, his soldiers mixed with the black girls throughout Italy. <laughs> However, she, she actually hated the Irish. And then when I married Susan Ryan, she had a heart attack. She said, Ryan, what kind of name is that for an Italian wife? The irony, dripping. Uh, have I said anything uh, that's unwoke so far? <laughs> well, look, I, I, my, I, we are not... Let me ask you that. You said, no, well, we're don't not... say anything that's all, that, you know, you got to be woke. I judge. said, woke my ass. No, we're, we're not... I'm 82 years old. What are they going to do? <laughs> we're not here to judge. Turn a cross on my lawn? No, we're not here to judge. We are here to to delve. So let me ask you a couple of other quickies. Um, so, uh, so many. Am I being boring? No. The, you, you insisted I not be boring. Exact, I'm just giving you my A stuff. The exact opposite. Um, so broken patterns. Before we go off that. So, uh, okay. Plepler. Um, uh, who else did you sort of see out there? Not no Billy. Willie White was a great this, girl. Huh? Willie right. White was great. No Billy Jean King in in all of this. What, what? Uh, no, I wouldn't do her. Because I'll do, I'll do, I'll do the, 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 I'll do the, the, the uh, Czech girl who broke into tears when she first came from Czechoslovakia. What's her name? Maria, uh, Maria, uh, I can't think of it. I, I, not not the other girl, I used to play Chrissy Everett all the time. Martina Navratilova? My, Martina Navratilova. Yeah. Her I do in a minute. Because? There is a, a, there is a real person. Billie Jean King, give me a break. It's not a real person. You know, it's a, it's a, it's an image. They were looking for somebody like her. Martina, Martina should have been the most famous uh, athlete in the country, but she didn't have the right attitude. She was, well, she, I don't even know whether she was gay or not, but, but the point is. She didn't, she, she, you know, Chrissy Ever. Now, Chrissy Ever was a, was a very popular girl, but she could never be too popular. You know why? Because Chrissy Ever is a hard ass. And we, she, her father used to live right next door to us in Fort Lauderdale. And everybody said she was no cupcake. She was a tough cookie, Chrissy. And so uh, those kind of women don't become, I mean, Chrissy was fabulous. And well known, but she never did anything. I mean, as an athlete, she did was great, but I mean, she never was like a idol like Billie Jean King. 
I mean, I mean you know, uh, Billie Jean King was idolized as as what? I don't know. Well, she she became so much. She became many more things. Uh, people put a lot of sort That's of I mean. things on her back, right? To, uh, right. right. Chrissy, Chrissy was a tennis player, and uh, Martina was a tennis player. They were the greatest. I don't know. No, they were not personalities. Chrissy wouldn't want to be, and Martina couldn't be. I mean, I, I interviewed her once for a, a tiny story at her house, and she was a rise. It's like talking to. Uh, you know, she, she she used similar language to me, but not quite as profane. Which was like talking to Joan Joyce. Th- those those girls were real athletes. All right, oh, I couple, said girls again. Yeah. Well, I, okay. So a couple other pieces that that uh, stand out to me uh, among just uh, it's impossible yeah. to choose. But um, so sticking on tennis for a second. Um, the story you wrote about Renee Richards, uh, Renee's oh. retreat. Oh, painful story. Very painful. I went with my wife, Susan. <clears throat> uh, we flew up from Florida. The plane was delayed. We went to our, our doctor's office, uh, where she uh, on Park Avenue. And they were already gone to their Bedford place. They had a place in Bedford or one of those places on a lake, you know, her and her girlfriend, which I found strange. So um, her girlfriend would send us Christmas cards all the time. Helen, I think her name was. Anyway, uh, so we had to take a train, train, like, you know, it was like, uh, what was it? Trains, planes, and automobiles in order to get up to this godforsaken place in upstate New York. We got there, and poor Renee was when as she when she was Richard Raskin, she was six, three or four or whatever, a hundred and like fifty five pounds, right? When she was Renee Richards, she was six three or four, like two twenty. It was very difficult. Uh, she was great, and her girl was great, you know. And she told me a funny story. <laughs> this, I don't know. Did I ever write? Did I write it? You know, the thing. I'll tell you the story. You could edit this if you want. No, go ahead. She said she met Christine Jorgensen after Renee had the operation, right? She met Christine Jorgensen, who had the operation first. So Christine says to her, and what did you do with yours? <sighs> was there an answer? Uh, that was just, no, it was a question. <laughs> left, that, left it out there, okay. Yeah, it was a Perhaps question. Wisely. So that was, that, was those two, that was those two girls' first words. Somebody thought it would be great to put them together. Jeez. Um, Actually, I, 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 Renee was cool. She was working with a she was working with a boy tennis player when I was up there. She was a coach, and she wanted to kill him. He was a spoiled little brat, you know. And I was watching her, <laughs> and she she had that aggressive nature that you might you know for years was classified as a male nature, you know, aggressive and combative and all that kind of stuff. Today, women have it, or well, maybe they always had it. Yeah, and I'm and, getting less. No, I'm getting less woke as we. Go. No, well, but 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 it's and it, but it's interesting. It's fascinating to see the in many respects long overdue sort of. Um, I, I don't even sort of narrow it down to quote unquote equality, but just sort of the uh, the uh, the attention and the elevation, I guess, of I think to the traditional quote unquote male dominated sports world. Right, the, the, the women's yeah. sports is not something that just sort of showed up overnight. Right. But, but no way. When, I mean, like, women's basketball was a disaster. No, right. The, and, when and, first, and, there was like, wait, like they were, like they were wait, waiting through water. You know, I, I told that to some woman golfer so, 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 20 years ago, maybe maybe 30 years ago. He said, I can't watch women's basketball. It's like watching people wade through water playing basketball. They were slow. They didn't have any, you know, they weren't real basketball players. Now they're basketball players, yeah. I mean, no. number one, they had to develop physically. You know, basketball is a physical sport. 
You don't see any female baseball players, do you? Well, uh, and that's not for a lack of of uh, of trying and and uh, and. Uh, they can try. Well, you know, uh, but you know, I, I think there's. Uh, stay tuned. I think I think there's a lot more to come in. Um, I, look, I you know, you look at something like, for example, also ahead of its time, and and this is a segue into it quickly is yeah. is the Wilt Chamberlain story, right? So the International oh, Volleyball Association, great guy. Mary Jo Pepler played in the IVA, right? And talk about something lost to history. But in many respects, right, along this is around the time of the of World Team Tennis, which itself was trying to equate male and female yeah. uh, tennis playing, right? But on the volleyball court, it was even more so, right? It wasn't even it was more mixed and 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 uh, uh, you know, integrated. It's not the right word, but uh, yeah, but it was, it was mixed because it come from California. I mean, it was an outdoor. It wasn't. It wasn't a professional thing. Volleyball. It sprang up as a, a kids going to the beach and and uh, jumping in the sand and hitting the ball over the net. Boys and girls together. So it it, it began integrated. It might have become unintegrated when it became professional and it was the men's volleyball and the women's volleyball. But volleyball is one of the few sports that began as an integrated sport. It was a it was a Southern California thing. Basketball didn't be, become in, integrated. Volleyball always was into, integrated when it was in California in the twenties and the thirties and all that shit. And you and you tackled Wilt, uh, obviously a, a lifelong uh, volleyball player and enthusiast, and then uh, obviously he yeah. was commissioner of this IVA for a while. W- w- what was your sensibility there? Because you were actually you were you were dealing with him sort of in the in the 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 the, pa- the past of his career, right, or the waning years. Oh yeah, he was over. Uh, you know, he was, uh, he was one of the great guys. I got to tell you a funny story. <laughs> I'm a writer. I always got stories. I go there with Wilt. I do two things. It's up on Mulholland Drive. I always go early. Number one, I'm terrified I'm going to be late, so I get there and find out where the place is that I'm supposed to be. Once I find a place, I gauge how long it's going to take me to get from a coffee shop to the place, and then I go and sit down and have coffee and read my notes. So I got to Wilt's place, nothing around it, nothing. I mean, other, except other houses. I went like 10 miles, 15 miles. Couldn't find a gas station. So finally I said, screw it. I got to go back. I was supposed to meet him at 1 o'clock. I get there at 1230. He comes to the door in his pajamas. He said, oh, Pat, he said, I was going to set the house up for you. I was going to put the lights on around the pool and everything so you could see the effect of, a, you know, and he was going to stage manage. So I said, I don't give a shit about the light boots. <laughs> I just came here to talk to you. So we talked for four or five hours. We had fun. And I told him my, my wife and I lived in North Carolina in the mountains for a couple of years. And my wife loved the Cherokee Indian history there. And he said he told us he's part Cherokee from North Carolina. So he's, he's black and Cherokee. And he said he used to have summers in uh, North Carolina with relatives who had Cherokee background. So I said, oh, my life, she'd love to talk to you about that. So I get on the plane at 1 o'clock in the morning to go uh, to Red Eye to go back to Fort Lauderdale. My wife's going to pick me up at 6 in the morning at the airport. So she gets to the airport. She's half asleep. I said, I told you I was going to be in at 6. She said, Will called me at 2 in the morning, Eastern time, which was 11 his time. She said, we talked for three hours. She said, <laughs> she didn't know anything about Wilt. You know, she knew he was a basketball player. So that's the end of the story. I said, well, he probably wants you to be 20,000 and first. You know, he, he once said in his book that he had <laughs> sex with 20,000 women. It was a nice even number. I said, Susan, you're going to be 20,000 and one of Wilt Chamberlain if he ever meets you. Because my wife uh, was famous in Fort Lauderdale. She was a bodybuilder, and I mean, you know, she was, I I have to be honest, she was the most beautiful woman in Fort Lauderdale. Really beautiful, because she would lift weights, and she was way ahead of her time being muscular and big and all that. Anyway, so, and she was blonde and blue-eyed, so we go out. As soon as you go out with me to do a story, I'm doing a story on a modeling agency in South Beach. And we were early. So we went to the China Grill 
where all the people want to be noticed go. And uh, we're sitting, at, we're standing at the bar. I look up, there's a, a step up to the dining room, and there's Will sitting. I mean, you can't miss him. He's sitting with two people, uh, two white, a white guy and a blonde girl. And the, the white guy and the blonde girl are obviously together. Now, Will doesn't know what Susie looks like. Now, Susie looks like a Playboy bunny. So she's wearing spandex that looks like sprayed on paint and strippers, stiletto heels, right? With a tan and short blonde hair and blue eyes. I said, baby, go walk up those stairs and just walk past Wilt's table. Said, That's all. Don't say a word. Just walk like you know. She goes up there. Wilt sees her. He leaps up in the air. He grabs her, tries to get her to sit down at the table. And she says, well, I'm, I'm here with my husband. Do you mind if he comes up too? He says, where is he? And she points to me, and I wave to Will, and he bursts out laughing. It was hysterical. He said, you set me up. I said, of course. That's... So Susie wants to be 20,001. <laughs> I won't ask where the story went after that. That was it. No, I mean, no, no. <laughs> Susie and I, Susie, you know, which, which brings me full circle to my uh, my lesbian novel, which you didn't know. <laughs> All right, before before we get to that, uh, we'll add that we'll put that the, the, as the cherry on top. I, I do want to. I, I was uh, from a full circle perspective. I do want to touch on before we leave is oh. is um, your uh, your other work, uh, a nice Tuesday, which essentially is your shall we say unceremonious or maybe I don't know rehabilitated visit back into the the realm of baseball in this case the independent league. Back in the day, when yes. the, uh, with the north, when the northern league and the northeast league uh, uh, existed, and I don't yeah. want to get into the contraction thing with major league baseball, but w- to tell me when that was, what that was, and why was that was. Fifty six, so it was probably nineteen ninety six or ninety five. I'm not sure the exact date. I was fifty six. I did a story on Mike Vick. Uh, his father loved the fall spring. Bill Beck. You know Bill Beck, right? Yes, and I've, I've actually, yeah. uh, way back when, when I was a CBS News producer, actually uh, met and interviewed and had a few folks around uh, Mike Beck, too, so know, know his story as yeah. well. So uh, Bill Beck was a great guy. I never met him, but he loved the fall spring. He gave it to his kid when the kid was younger, Mike. Mike loved it, and so, uh, you know, I, I wanted to do a story on Mike Mike's wacky promotions out at uh, in... Um, not Minneapolis, St. Paul. But we had the St. Paul Saints. So, sure, Pat, come up here, do I do anything? I'm dying to meet you. Never, you know, my dad always talked about your book and all that. But, so I go up there, and I do what I usually do. Uh, I go to the games for about four days. You know, I got my press credentials early, so I can get in, and that's it. I just go to the games, wander around, see all the wacky things that are going on there, tattoos, uh, face painting, um, you know, all this stuff, doing all my research. Finally, somebody grabs me, and they said, are you Pat Jordan? I said, yeah. He says, Mike's been looking for you for four days. He says, he says what were you doing? I said, well, I was just wandering around and see what's going on here. So anyway, I went, I went down, saw Mike, and we became we became good friends. Both had the same weird sense of humor. And well, what was your question? I rambled off. I, the, I wanted to get a sense of of uh, why uh, the attempt to come back into. I mean, uh, oh, okay, that's it. Yeah. That's go. Now I pick up the paper a year later in. Uh, October, Charlie Sheen wants to pitch baseball again. He's a baseball pitcher, supposedly, you know, the actor. And Mike Vex says he's going to sign him to pitch for the St. Paul Saints. So I call up Vex, screaming at him. I say, Mike, what the fuck? You're going to put that fucking actor on the mound? I'll get in shape and I'll pitch for you. He says, you're on. I said, what? He said, you're on. I'll, I'll sign you up. You can pitch. Get in shape. Next summer, you can pitch for me. 
So I get off the phone. I'm white as a sheet. Susan says, what's wrong? I said, I did it this time. I said, I told Mike, if he's going to pitch Charlie Sheen, I'll get in shape. He said, okay, you're on it. She said, well, if you put your foot in it, I don't. So I went and got a high school kid, and I started in, like, November, like four feet from the screen. I couldn't couldn't reach the screen. And through it with two, three or four days a week and got in shape. It was throwing good. Maybe 85, 86-mile-an-hour fastball, good slider, not as wild as I used to be, presentable, you know. So uh, I'm all ready to go, and I see Mike Vex signs Isla Borders. I said, what's an Isla Borders? Ah, uh-huh. talk about women you know, who in baseball. Should, Here we go. She's the first woman in baseball. The pitch. He signs Isla Borders to pitch for. I said, what the fuck? I said, I call him up, Mike. I said, what are you doing? You're getting every freak? I'm not a freak. I'm getting in shape. You got Charlie Sheen. You know, hopefully he won't be coked out when he's on the mound. And now you got a girl pitching for you, and I'm going to pitch for you too, an old man? He said, I was going to call you about that. He said, I can't have three freaks in this show. So he fired me. So he says, he said, I can't have three, three, I can't have Charlie Sheen, who had a bad reputation. Isla Borders, who was a woman nobody ever heard of in baseball. And Pat Jordan, who was a retired baseball player of 30 years ago, or 40 years almost, you know. So the, everybody thought it was a joke, but I was, you know, I've gotten serious shape. I wouldn't do anything. It was a joke. So Mike said, I'll call I'll tell, uh, the guy, uh, Wolf, who uh, runs that minor league baseball thing. What's his name? Good guy. Miles. Miles Wolf. Do you know him? I do not, but I'm familiar with the name. Yeah, good guy. He was in charge of all minor leagues, especially the independent leagues. He had a newspaper and all. So uh, Mike called him. Said I promised this guy to pitch, but he said he's in shape. And you know, Miles knew me. He called me up. He said, "You want to pitch?" He said, "We got a team in Waterbury." So I said, "Yeah, I'll go to Waterbury. What the hell?" But now this is this gives me more pressure because now I'm going back to my home turf. You know what I mean? To make a fool of myself a second time. But a better story, don't you think? Yeah. But I would have been. I, I, I wanted to go out to uh, St. Paul. Nobody knew me. I sneak in pitch an inning or two or whatever, and then no matter how bad I could do, it's not going to be a story. But now the hometown boy who couldn't make it comes back home, desperate, you know. So that put a lot of pressure on me. I got a migraine on the airplane that night, uh, the morning when we came in. So Susie was with me, <laughs> and she's sitting in the stands while we're doing calisthenics, all these young guys. And I'm there, they're looking at me, I got a white beard. I was going to shave the beard, but I said, fuck it. So I kept the beard. So uh, she's in the stands, and the guys are all gawking at her. And they said, man, man, look at that chick. Oh, man. I said, are you kidding me? You guys wouldn't be able to handle it. I said, I'll go over, I'll get her hotel key right now. So I said, oh, get out of here, man. You're out of your mind. So I went over to Susan and I said, give me your hotel key. <laughs> so we chat up for about two minutes. I get her hotel key. I go back to the guys. I dangle it in front of them. They laugh their ass off. I never told them it was my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, in many respects, um, this book is, it's, it's, it, I think it's a great, uh, it's almost like a bookend in some respects, literally and figuratively, right? So uh, there's a lot of, um, shall we say, processing that's uh, sort of uh, in the in the nice Tuesday from uh, the fall spring. It, it And again, th- th- yeah, there's baseball is it's almost sort of a, a subtext, right, for. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, a, it's a family book. A, a, a nice Tuesday. A nice Tuesday was better than the fall spring. I thought it was a deeper book. I think right? it's right. I honestly believe that's right. But and and yeah, yeah nobody but, bought it. Yeah. The best book I've got is coming out this summer. Okay, it's nice. Called segue. My Father's Con. There's a nice segue. Go ahead. Yeah, that is the entire story. 
of my family going back before I was born. My father was an orphan, gambler, professional con man, grifter. Taught me everything I know, the smartest guy I ever met. And uh, other than me, you could never get over that, that I was smarter than him. When's, it, when's that yeah, coming what, what? What, Again, the title and when's that coming out? Uh, it's about the late spring, early summer. It's called My Father's Con, C-O-N-N, uh, C-O-N. And uh, my father was so funny. He, he was, uh, he was born, and two minutes later, his mother gave him up for adoption to an orphanage. And he stayed in the orphanage for 15 years. Never knew his mother, never knew his father. 15 years, they threw him out in the city streets. And he got a job sleeping out of a pool hall in Bridgeport. And they allowed him to sleep on the, the tables at night because he didn't have any place to stay. So what, he's got all the pool talk. What do you think he starts doing? Starts banging the balls around the table. Within two years, he's the greatest pool shooter on the East Coast. He's, he's fast, Eddie Felson. But actually, he's more Minnesota fats. Because my father never liked to be splashy. And he became a great pool. So all the, all the wise guys would, would uh, uh, bankroll him. And he, anybody came into town and wanted to play pool, you play, play the kid. My father was like 17 now. And so they played this, you know, very boyish looking kid. He was, he looked like William Hurt. And uh, they bankrolled him for thousands. He was a 17 year old kid who'd walk around with three or four grand in his pocket. This is 19, let's see, he was born in 1910, 30, 28, something like that. And, uh, he treated everybody. My father never cared about money. Gave it away. He used to send me, when I wanted to buy a house, he was, he was sending, sending cash in a FedEx envelope. 30000 40000 I said, Dad, what are you doing in FedEx? Why don't you just send me a check? He said, no. I said, well, what's FedEx anyway? Why don't you send it to the post office? He said, it's a federal offense if you send it in post office. And it's uh, illegal money. I said, where did the money come from? He said, you don't want to know. That's the kind of guy he was. Did, did your so dad, never, did your well, dad get I to never see? do anything through the U.S. mails, all this FedEx. Did your dad get to see your writing success? And, and... Oh, yeah. Okay. He, used to play, he used to have the, the car. He, poor guy. He uh, was so thrilled when I was writing for Sports Illustrated. I see him one day down in Bridgeport. And he's got the trunk of his car open in front of this uh, bar where all the, the gamblers hang out. And guys are coming out, and he's got all my Sports Illustrated, like the latest story, maybe 20 copies. And he's handing it out to the guys to read. The Sonny Boy wrote, right, the story? And I come over, I said, Dad, what are you doing? Where did you get these copies? So I bought them. He said, that way you'll make more money. He thought it was like a book. That every book I sold, I got 10% or 20%. And he thought the magazines were the same. I said, no, Dad, I get a one fee, and it doesn't matter if they sell a million Sports Illustrated or two, I get the same fee. So you waste it all, and I can get you, I can get you all these magazines for nothing. So tell me what you want, and I'll do it. But that's the kind of guy. Oh, this is funny. This is a good story. He was on an airplane once, Pat Jordan, and I had a big story in Sports Illustrated. Stewardess read it. And she said, uh, would Mr. Pat Jordan please stand up, please? So my father's in the aisle. He stands up. She comes down to him. She shows him. She said, did you write this story for Sports Illustrated? She said, he said, yes, I did. So she brings him up to the front of the plane and announces they have a writer celebrity on the airplane, Pat Jordan, who just wrote the story for Sports Illustrated. It was my old man. That's, 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 that, you know, heart of gold, right? Uh, that's, I can't wait. Through. So that's great. And how, how, uh, how much uh, of the, um, of the, the baseball Braves story, I'm sure his opinions and stuff are part of that mix are going to be in that book too. It's, it's literally. There's, the a, there's some, there's some stuff, no, yeah. no major league because I did it with a fall spring. So I, yeah. I, I have a, a great minor league story when I pitch in the senior city league, 15 year old kid. 
uh, out of high school. I'm sorry, not out of high school. It was during the summer. I pitched against Tommy Casagrande. You know who Tommy Casagrande? I Tommy don't, Big but House. With a name like that, I should. Tommy Big House uh, from uh, Wallingford, Connecticut. <clears throat> uh, big. He he was what Whitey Ford would have been if Whitey Ford was bigger and had better stuff. Uh, Thomas Casagrande, Thomas Big House, was a 6'3", 220-pound left-hander with freckled pink skin and blue eyes and blonde hair, just like Whitey Ford, except he was Italian. He must have come from Milan or someplace, or Switzerland. So anyway, uh, he was a left-handed pitcher. He got a huge bonus for the Phillies, 60 grand. When it, and this was in like the forties, right? Where they were, where they weren't passing out money in those days. And he called up to the Phillies for a cup of coffee, but he hurt his arm. And he came back to the Senior City League to pitch. So he's, it was, you know, he was really good. You could see he must have been great, but his fastball was straight. Now, I mean, he maybe maybe touched ninety once in a while. His curveball didn't have that that really uh, dropped to it. It was just sort of rolled in, but you knew it had once been great. You could see his greatness, and plus he had the most beautiful motion. So first game I pitched in the Senior City League at 15, this is after I struck out 19 batters in high school. And because I struck out 19 in high school, I didn't want to play in the Babe Ruth League with with kids my age or the, the American Legion, I wanted to play with somebody better than me. So I, I played against these 30, 40-year-old guys, Tom Casagrande. So anyway, I pitched. And uh, it's a very funny story. you gotta, you got to read it. And uh, I beat him two to one. No more, no more de- the days of uh, 16, 18 strikeouts were long gone with these guys. I think I struck out eight or nine in the game, gave up about six hits, and Tommy, so now after the game's over, they're all going to the White Eagle Hall, one of the the team that Tommy played with, and have beer and sandwiches, so I'm a kid, 15, I didn't drive, my parents dropped me off, they said they'll pick me up in two hours, so I go in there, we've still got our uniforms on, you know, dirty and everything. And I'm there, and all these guys, old guys, 40, some 50. You know, I'm just, I'm like a baby. So all of a sudden, the floor is parted like the Red Sea. Tommy Casagrande, big house, barreling through all the guys, coming straight towards me, and he's got two beers in his hand. And he hands one to me, and he then he pulls one out of his uh, pulls his pack of cigarettes out of his back pocket and offers me a smoke. I said, Tommy, I don't smoke. He said, well, you're going to have to learn. Uh, that's all right. I forgot you're only a kid, but you're going to have to learn how to drink beer. It's the first beer I ever had. So I had, I had beer with him. And he, he says to me, this is a funny story. He says, kid, you're going to be in the big league someday. And it's going to be soon. So I, I told him, so... <laughs> My mother and father picked me up, and in the in the book I wrote, my father picked me up. He said, How did, "What did Tommy say to you?" And I said, "I said, Dad, he said I was going to be in the big league someday, soon." And then I, I that was the quote. And then I thought, but Tommy was wrong. Yeah. Are you? Do you have another job, or am I boring you? No, I. I that's just. I, it was just this poignant. So I wanted to give it a pregnant pause there. Um, very <laughs> no, I mean, and look, and that's look, and that's why we reached out because uh, you know, I my hope for you, um, not that you necessarily so make a million fucking dollars. That's what your hope should be. Well, there's that, but um, I, part of that to me is that that this book could be uh, hopefully uh, a bit of a rediscovery of the the origin stories of this, whether that's the yeah. fall spring book or something. Well, there's a lot of little league stuff in it that I never wrote too. The little league stuff is even great. My brother and I, I used to go over it. He would remember because he would go to the games. I, I told you, I, one year I struck out everybody I faced except two batters. So 18 batters a game. Four, four games I struck out 18. Four perfect games. 
In two games, I struck out 17. Two guys tried to bunt. So I was on television. I was in Mel Allen's uh, sports show at uh, the age of 12. You know, before the game, they would interview celebrities. I was a celebrity. They didn't talk to me. They talked to my mother and father. So uh, when uh, Casey Stingle said, I heard he knew all about me. He said, I heard your feelers don't need no gloves with you, sonny boy. I said, no, they don't. So I figured they were going to pitch. You know, the Yankees were going to sign me right there. So I had my little suit on, and I brought my baseball glove in a brown paper bag. And uh, I was waiting for Mel Allen to say, to say to, hey, Pat, why don't you throw a few for us and show us what you got? And I'd go out there on a warm-up mound and blister in a couple of fastballs, making Vic Rashi's fastball look pathetic compared to mine. And out would come Casey Stingle, and he'd have this contract in his hand. He'd give it to me. And he turned his back and said, just sign it on my back, Sonny Boy. You're going to play with the Yankees. But it never happened. My goodness. Holy mackerel. So much there. So much to unpack still. And um, let's see. Let's get a few things uh, promoted and uh, suggested for you to go further in uh, the various uh, components of this conversation we just had. The book, A False Spring, came back out uh, in a re-release in September of 2005 uh, from Bison Books, which is an imprint of uh, our pals at University of Nebraska Press. So make sure you get that, A False Spring. Make sure you also uh, check out uh, Tom Seaver and Me, which came out in uh, 2020, uh, which is basically a 40-year uh, story relationship uh, uh, between uh, Messrs. Jordan and Seaver, uh, a, an excellent baseball uh, book for sure. Uh, be on the lookout for uh, Pat's new book, a, uh, a novel coming out. No, it's not a novel. Sorry, it's a memoir. He's got a novel work he's working on as well. <laughs> it's let's put it this way it has nothing to do with baseball I'll put it that way uh, but the uh, memoir uh, coming out very shortly called Baggage My Father's Con uh, certainly we'll get into a little bit of his uh, his upbringing as part of that uh, of that story that's coming out soon I'm not sure where, the, where it's going to be published but uh, it's coming out uh, in relatively short order so keep a lookout for that we'll also let you know when that's coming out too all those books and more and by the way you should also check out uh, a list of um some of the other books that uh, 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 Pat has out there, some of them are still in print, some of them are not in print, uh, but there, is a, there are various collections of his sports writing, like the best sports writing of Pat Jordan, uh, which is out there. A Nice Tuesday, uh, which is his uh, return to minor league baseball in 1997 when he played for the uh, Westbury Spirit, and uh, obviously the uh, bookend, if you will, from his, um, his journey as a minor leaguer with the Braves, as we discussed. Um, uh, just some other the uh, a, a great book on um, uh, on uh, women's sports. Uh, uh, Pat being one of probably the the earliest, uh, 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 if you will, a sort of uh, uh, authentic voices about uh, the professional uh, opportunities and growth of women's sports called Broken Patterns. Um, that's where the uh, Mary Jo Pepler story uh, is embedded, and uh, and others. Uh, of that era uh, as well in women's sports and so many other great books um, well worth and you can check out uh, those books and and what they're all about at patjordanstories.com patjordanstories.com all right so much stuff there go online uh, check out men's journal for past articles check out sports illustrated uh, archives for past uh, articles just great stuff from pat jordan all over the place Uh, you will uh, be rewarded for everything that you read from uh, from pat Let's see. Uh, if you'd like to get those books uh, conveniently through our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com and be, give us a couple of shekels of love when you do so, we appreciate that. Uh, just search up this episode number 252 on the goodseatsstillavailable.com and you'll find convenient links to most of those books I just mentioned and others, of course, for all of the other literary works that have been mentioned uh, or touted 
uh, in our previous episodes. That's the place, our website, goodseatstillavailable.com, where you will find all of our episodes, past, present, and future. But of course, the easiest and best way to keep abreast of uh, all the latest episodes that we throw out your way is to subscribe or follow us, for God's sakes. Just your favorite podcast uh, a player or, or feed, whatever. We're, we're available wherever you can find great podcasts. So just uh, click on us there and, and put us on your list. And we appreciate that. We also appreciate your reviews, especially those five star and uh, wonderful uh, uh, gushing praise type reviews. We uh, just throw those in there. That'll help the algorithm and other people like you discover the show more easily. So we appreciate that. We also appreciate you following us on social media. You'll find us uh, on Facebook, there's a, a, a page devoted to us there. You'll find us on uh, Instagram. You'll find us at Good Seats Still Available there. Uh, and on Twitter, we're at Good Seats Still. You can send us email at hello at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Thanks for that. And if you'd like to subscribe to our little weekly email newsletter, which is really just a little tip off of what we're going to be talking about next uh, week, uh, just uh, search on the website uh, there and you will find a link there with your uh, request for a name and a, an email address and, and we'll put you on the list. Uh, thanks to Jerry Payne, of course, as always, uh, for his um, fine knob twiddling. Thank you, sir. And uh, thanks again to you, the great listeners out there, for keeping us going. Uh, more fun and frivolity to come to you next week. Let's leave you with a little ditty, shall we? Let's go back to the origination of this story uh, with Pat. Uh, the Milwaukee Braves. Yes, it's uh, from 1957, their championship year on Waukee Records. It's Song of the Milwaukee Braves. Uh, the Steve Swedish Orchestra uh, and male chorus, of course. And uh, it's the song of the Braves. Enjoy and remember the Milwaukee Braves in all their glory. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye. Milwaukee, the home of the family.